This morning we take another look, another context of faith. Because another thing we might say about any principle in Scripture, it's kind of like a diamond. You can take it, rotate it, and look at it through an equally beautiful but different angle. And this morning with faith, that's what we're doing. We're looking at faith. We're going to look at faith again and balance it against something. But this time, not thinking of faith from that angle of inner condition as much as uh, uh, something else. Faith is said to be this as well. As we, uh, you can find in Hebrews 11.1. Uh, 1. And it's being defined here. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is faith? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's the substance of things hoped for, but not yet seen. So faith being hope, okay? When the Bible says hope, what kind of hope is it talking about? Hope in what? Hope for what kind of things? And even just in this chapter 11 of Hebrews, if we broke it down and we looked at all the different things that it is, it is uh, hope in the rescue against physical dangers. It's hope uh, for the promise from God that just isn't fully received yet. It, it's hope for an earthly destiny right now. It's uh, hoping for um, being delivered from hardships. It's hope for uh, incredible, even impossible victories that couldn't come any other way but through God. And then we get into the really important stuff. It's hope for a friendship with God. A friendship with God. This is where it gets personal. It's hope in sharing in Christ's resurrection. This is where it gets incomprehensible. It's hope in sharing Christ's eternal destiny. There are some big, big, huge hopes that are uh, claimed and stated by Christianity. And all of these hopes that are biblical are what make up faith. That is faith itself. Napoleon Bonaparte said, uh, courage is like love. It must have hope for nourishment. And that's what hope is. Hope is nourishment to the human spirit. Hope is that thing that uh, is the very fabric of faith that God gives us. And of course, we're talking about hope in what God promises. It's power. It is power. But the thing is, as beautiful as that sounds, that even this faith, this faith we're talking about that is power, needs to be balanced against something else. Well, what does hope need to be balanced against? Well, it needs to be balanced against experience, against things that are actually experienced. Now, just imagine if the Bible was just um, a one long book of hope that... Nobody in the Bible ever really came across God, uh, but they had a hope for Him. Uh, no, there was never any experience of God, but it was just, oh, it's going to happen. It was just all one long promise. It really wouldn't be that hopeful, would it? it it's a, not very affirming. Let's get this big book about just the hope. It needs to be balanced, and we find that if we do look through Scripture, in fact, it is balanced against people who have experienced directly God Himself and experienced Him. So if hope, if faith is this amazing hope, this God-sized hope, then what's this godly experience? Then what's, what's the other side? Scripture talks about it, uh, knowing God right now. Knowing God right now. And uh, it is something that as we read through Scripture and you read through history, you find out the, the experience of God is something that has happened. It's already happened to people, to humanity. It is happening at this very moment. <laughs> And it will happen. And it will continue to happen. There's a verse that when it comes to the idea of experiencing God, I love to share with people more than anything else. And it's, it's a verse from Psalms 34, verse 8 actually. And it is this, Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts me. Taste and see that the Lord is good. A lot of people live like Abraham who got a small taste, but the, the major part of it was yet to come. But there was the taste of God. Uh, this verse, I think, became, was one of my favorites when I was sharing it with teens. We had, a, at one time, a teen group starting up way, way back. And these young folks weren't really church people, the school that was starting up. And they were just in the first steps of knowing who and what God was all about. And, and a very honest question came up from them was, well, how do you experience God? How do you even do that? Or how do you even know for certainty that there is a God? And I said, well, I'll give you a one word answer, or actually a two word answer. Taste it. I just told them, taste it. And 
you can imagine, I get some pretty strange looks. How do you taste God? How, how, what does God taste like? What's, what are you saying to us? Well, and then I pointed them towards this psalm that I read to you, Psalm 34. And, uh, uh, and we looked at this word as, what does it mean to taste? Now, usually the word taste comes up when we think of food. We think of eating, but not always. Uh, especially babies. You ever notice babies? They stick everything in their mouth. And it's not because they're hungry all the time. It's just taste is a very, uh, very close-up, very intimate way to experience something. You know, what does plastic taste like? What does this taste like? They'll taste everything. And of course, with sticking things in your mouth, if you take a big enough taste, it becomes part of you. Here, try this chocolate, take it, take it, you know, and you eat it, and then it goes to your hips, right? Like, it's, 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 uh, it becomes part of you. That's what taste is all about, is this taking inside and experiencing. <clears throat> so how do we taste God? Well, it's uh, one thing is it says right here in this question of tasting God, an answer given in scriptures from the same psalm, the next line down says, Revere Yahweh, uh, the most personal name for him. Revere Yahweh, his holy ones, for <clears throat> in him there's no lack for those who revere him. There's no lack for those who revere him. Now it's interesting, it says, Revere Yahweh, you want to taste him, revere him. The word revere has a whole bunch of meanings in that original Hebrew. It has other words like trust, fear, uh, and, and uh, awesome dread, even if you go into Old English. Um, there's a lot of things that mean revere. And they're all the right words because God is that powerful that it's uh, you can be intimate, but uh, there better be a lot of healthy respect in it as well as you were intimate with God. Revere God. Trust in Him. To trust in God. So how did this writer say you trust in God? If that's how you taste God is to, among all the words, trust Him. How do you trust? In a nutshell, the author, David, as he's saying this, explains further. To trust Him means that he sought Him. That's what he says in the psalm. He sought Him. The word barash in, the, in that Hebrew. And it also means not simply to trust, but to follow What's the implication that trust means follow? It means that trust isn't a passive thing. It's not, I'm just going to sit here and trust that God comes through. It is, I am going to follow God. It is an active thing. As a matter of fact, if you go and you do a little word study, and look where this seeking God goes, and you'll usually find it with descriptors like diligent, with all your heart, with everything you are, with all your will. It's a very active thing. To taste God involves you with all your heart. Diligent. Seeking. Seeking Him. Okay, then the writer says, He answered me and He delivered me. That, that's what happened to Him. That's His claim. That's His testimony. When I trusted God, I tasted God, and I trusted Him with all I am, He delivered me. Delivered me out of what? You know, the longer I, in the pastoral side of things, I find that one of the greatest paralyzers of people's lives is fear. If there's anything, anything people need to be delivered from is fear. And, and you may be saying, well, that's not me. I'm, I'm a pretty brave out there person. Fear has a lot of subtle ways of coming into a person's life. And it's amazing what it will paralyze. And fear in itself isn't the only thing. Fear is that breeding ground for anger, for, for lying. That lying even to yourself for distrust, for unforgiveness, for uh, delusion. So much can come out of fear if it's allowed to have control. And the author is saying that in my experience with God, he delivered me from that. He delivered me from fear. He delivered me from everything that goes with fear. I was able to conquer it because I have a direct experience with God. So we need the hope. But we need the experience, too. We need them both. Faith is an astounding power, but so is experience in God. An astounding power. And, and a real Christian life is a balance of the two. It's not all one or the other. What happens if you do get out of balance in these two things? In this kind of faith, and in this thing we're calling Godly experience. So just quickly, we'll take a look at things. God gives uh, verses like this, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. 
For when he has been proved, he will receive what the Lord has promised to those who love him. From Matthew to Revelation, you'll find this. There's this whole thing you can look through and it says, if you hang in there, if you endure, you, you don't have all the promise in your hand yet, but if you endure, there's your hope. You, you will have it if you just hang in there. And yet there's other verses, uh, like Psalm 31, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up. It's already done. This has already been experienced. And have not left for my foes to rejoice over me. And in this word lifted up, man, it's a really interesting word picture in the Hebrew because it literally means to dangle a rope. It means like uh, if you were going to a well and, uh, you know, out here in Gary, it's like, now we, we're out with the times we have elected pumps, but if we didn't, we have a big hole and we lower a bucket in a well and pull up the water. We dangle the bucket down. Well, that's what it says when delivers dangling a rope. Now, when I read this, and granted, I've got the mind of a six-year-old, so this is the way to think. I just saw this comic book thing, you know, you ever see the superhero thing, you know, where there's a big thing going on, and the helicopter flies over, and they, they drop a rope, and he grabs a rope, and off he goes, you know, hanging on the rope. Out from the midst, all, all this, these enemies are there, and boom, this rope comes down, boom, and he's gone. And this rope dangles down. That's kind of the word picture that, that David's talking here. He says, I was in a lot of trouble. I had a lot of enemies, and they were all around me, and I was, I was going to lose. And this rope came down, and I grabbed on it, and, and off I went. And, and I was saved, I was delivered. Well, you know, with us in our day, it's not so much a military or, or physical threat, at least not, not very often, hopefully, in our lives. But we still have all kinds of enemies. We've got uh, enemies that might be uh, our health is our enemy. Or it might be our finances are our enemy. Or it may even be our family. Or, or the people who are supposed to be our friends who are our enemies. And they, what is an enemy for the Christian is anyone who separates you from Christ. Anyone who breaks down your walk is an enemy. It doesn't mean you hate them. It means that they are doing you harm. I appreciated Bob uh, really came in. He said, you know what? Uh, I missed two weeks and I felt it. I started searching for stuff on the radio. The spiritual hunger started kicking up. And, and he's right. It's, once you're fed and you stop being fed spiritually, you start feeling it. And, and, you know, it's the kind of thing, if you don't need to be among God's people for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time, there's no condemnation there, but there's something that's not healthy inside that needs some change. When you're growing, you need the food. And in all of this, that's what, anyway, that's where we're going with this. In the deliverance, he was delivered from the enemies who were separating him from his God. The rope dangled down. God being the rope. He experienced it right then. It's available right now. It's available right at the time. Experience and hope. Balance. Sometimes you have to wait. Sometimes the answer is right there. So, if the rut of balance... Weird things start to happen. It's an uh, uh, imbalanced faith. Now, you can never have too much faith, you know, but you can have an imbalanced faith. You can have one that's the view is imbalanced, or the way you practice it, the way you understand it is imbalanced. And if you have an imbalance where you're all on the faith side, I can think of two scenarios that come up quite often in this imbalance to the faith side, to the hope side. The first one, I call it the someday scenario. The someday scenario kind of goes like this. Uh, there, there's an avoiding, actually, of a, a genuine expectation of God. And it's usually, oh, I believe God does miracles. I believe God is working right now. But somehow it always seems to be somewhere far off in some other part of the world. Or uh, some time beyond. Oh, biblical times, absolutely. God did amazing things then, but not so much now. Oh, I believe God's coming back. And when He comes back, then it's going to be amazing. But... Not too much right now. Not so much right now. And so, actually, in this kind of imbalanced faith in that direction requires less faith. Because you expect nothing. Oh, God's going to do something someday, but today, right now, I don't expect anything. And so, faith <coughs> becomes non-faith, really. Because the essence of faith is expectation of God about to work. That's what faith is. Another scenario we can take is to take it in faith. Uh, scenarios, what I would call, and, and this is where, uh, for instance, taking a difficult bit of scripture uh, or, or an event that, uh, especially in scripture, 
something that you just don't understand. And, they, and so many times we hear people say, well, I guess we're not supposed to understand that yet. Well, and sometimes, if anybody says they have all the answers, then, you know, you want to avoid that person because that's just not true. But when we say, oh, we just need to take it on faith, I, I'll be honest, I kind of push my teeth on it. Because if God's put it in His Word, there's something about it we're supposed to understand. So, the take it in faith, someday I will understand, can be, can be simply a case of our own laziness, either spiritually or intellectually. I would challenge you to this, is if you get a chance to uh, do a little bit of word searching through your scripture, try and find all the verses that are, you can't understand this now, but you will someday, to the verses that you can understand now. The no to not no verses in comparison. And you will find the Bible is a whole lot more about the no verses than the not no verses. God says you can know his mind. As a matter of fact, we are told to have the mind of Christ. Uh, we are told that He works in us for good. It is said that the Spirit of God comes into us and the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things. You can know the deep things of God. There's a whole lot more about knowing than not knowing. So before we accept something as, oh, we've got to simply take it in faith away down the road someday, maybe it needs a little search and expectation. Because bottom line, if you're in balance towards this someday scenario type of faith, what you are wrong of is expectation. Someday. Why should you expect anything today? You know, the faith is out there. Expect now. Expect to happen in a balanced faith. Well, how about experience? If you're in balance on the experience, it's all about now. It's all about experiencing everything about God right now. Uh, you know, there was a great example of that in uh, uh, that the uh, church uh, in, uh, let's see, I'm going to find my verse here. I want to make sure I tell you the right thing. Yep, the Corinth church. There was a thing going on, and Paul is writing to the church, and he's trying to get something in balance. And so, in the balance of things, he's saying this. <coughs> Uh, he's talking about a gift of tongues. And he's saying this, For he who speaks in tongues does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and calm comfort to men. What he was getting at was this, the gift of tongues. You know, depending, there's like two schools of thought that seem to be, at least in the American church, right? Is that either this is nuts, and, and, you know, it's way out of kilter. Uh, it doesn't really exist. Or it, that's what it's all about. You know, it's kind of one or the other in all of this. Well, even if uh, we are from the side that we're not real big on the whole thing of tongues, it's a biblically documented, nowhere does it say it ceased to exist thing. So what was it all about? Where did this come from, this whole tongues thing? Well, originally... Uh, in the early church, it was a gift of ecstasy. Uh, and I don't mean the drug, by the way. I'm talking about something spiritual. And what it was, it was this, that there was a connection with God that was so direct, that was so manifest, that was so concrete, that people would start uttering uh, mysteries of the faith uh, in, in a language that just wasn't understood by earthly ears. It, it was... Uh, something beyond us here. But it was all about this ecstasy of God manifesting Himself in you. What an experience. What if you could come and sit and just be so moved that God was just so real, just so in you, the experience was just so concrete that everything else just faded into dimness for a while. And it was just all you and God in this, in this amazing thing. Well, not surprising that it became the thing to have. It became the rage in the early church. Everybody wanted to experience this dramatic thing in that time. Uh, but if that became the be-all, end-all, if experience becomes the be-all, end-all, we run into another problem for them. Paul goes on to say this to them, uh, trying to get them in balance. Therefore, if the whole uh, church comes together in one place, and everybody starts speaking in tongues. And then someone comes in who is not informed, that is, they have never heard of this, or they are not a believer, will they not think you are out of your mind? Think about that for a minute. They come in and it's just everybody going, 
everything uh, 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 incomprehensible all at the same time, and somebody walks in who knows nothing about this. These folks are nuts. They're, they're out of their mind. Now, notice Paul's not diminishing the gift. As a matter of fact, he goes to, he says, I've experienced this myself. Pretty cool. But the fact is, is if that is your be all end all to have this experience, in experiencing the presence of God, you are actually abandoning the will of God. You're all about this personal experience, and meanwhile, uh, even by the experience itself, you are alienating the very people you're supposed to be reaching. So he's saying there are higher priorities than this ecstasy with God. That there are other things that you were supposed to be doing. And as a matter of fact, you're being negligent by chasing after your own personal high all the time. All the time. When we are balanced towards experience, we may even begin inventing things. We just need that next thing to substantiate our faith. Or we can fall in. And it may not be the tongues thing. It may not even be charismatic. It may be something, some other experience of how God delivered you from things. And you're looking for God to deliver you again. And you fall into this mentality of what has God done for me lately? You ever been there? Wow, it's, it's been... I've had some mountaintop experiences with God, but it seems like it's been years. God, I don't know, uh, what have you done for me lately, God? And the problem with the done for me lately thing is, it erodes the basic foundation of what Christianity is all about. Because what Christ is all about isn't what the little things he's done for you lately, it's what he did 2,000 years ago. It's been said and it's true. If Christ had died for you on that cross and opened up the way for you to approach God, that you could actually have a personal experience. Why should He have to do anything else for you? It's all great. It's all excellent. But if we're into the mountaintops, then we run into trouble because we're looking for the next one. And we forget the growth that a person usually has. The thing that really moves people the most is usually in the valleys, not the mountains. That's where the real soul sculpting goes. And I'll tell you something else and share with this with you. And usually the things, the more it seems like it's something you can see no reason for it happening to you, that is the very thing that is sculpting your soul the most. God, why should we think? Why should we think that we can see the whole picture of what God's doing in the little perspective we have in the lives we lead. It doesn't work that way. But if we're in balance towards experience, we may go that way, just like if we're towards faith. Imbalance can cripple you very badly in your walk. Balance is an important thing. So how are you guys doing? You balance? Balance congregation. That's a big question, and it wouldn't even be a fair question because as we point out, there's a lot of areas to balance. This is just one, faith and experience.